No, offer, I'm referred to as a political leader, but I am a minister, Christian minister of the gospel. It is my religion that makes me political, not my politics that make me religious. Religion obligates me to defend the poor and deliver the needy and set the captive free. And what strikes me about this organization, it's authentic faith without the frills. So often in institutionalized religion, we do an awful lot of church work, the maintenance of the institution, but often never get around to the work of the church. So as this organization seeks to focus on poverty and malnutrition and the health hazards that come as a result of that, that's the essence of our faith. And uh, this is an impressive mission because today we see this growing polarization between the wealthy who live in surplus and the poor who live in desperation. And now with the middle class sinking, uh, the poor, the numbers of the poor without protections are expanding. You got in trouble with the government challenging, challenging its priorities uh, and was seen as a a disturb of the peace. It was his mission to uh, disturb the peace, uh, as he would put it, disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed by raising basic questions. Uh, but what about the hungry? What about the leper? What about the woman who is at the well? He kept raising these basic questions moral questions about the plight of the poor. And frankly, that's why the Christian movement spread so rapidly that it was not focused on those who had assurances by institutionalized religion, the idea of focusing on the plight of the poor as being worthy, made attracted the poor to the religion, to, to his message. It is, it often is difficult to get the voices of the poor heard. It's almost always a minority voice against the wind. It's not much here with our space of Huddleston uh, down on the road to Trafalgar Square to save free Mandela, who had been in jail for 27 years. It was a minority voice uh, marched with him and the Archbishop Tutu and Oliver Tumbo. It was a light in darkness, but ultimately that light did shine enough to cast away the darkness. We marched uh, in the Hyde Park against the war in Iraq, ultimately proven to be an unnecessary war of choice. It was a, a minority point of view, but ultimately proved to be the right point of view. And so often those who would dare be change agents uh, must be lonesome lights in the darkness. Uh, the King will often say that popularity, vanity asked the question, is it popular? Um, and the polls may say a given issue may not be popular. And politics asked the question, will it work? Can I win? And morality asked, and conscience asked the question, is it right? The organization may neither be popular nor politic, but if it's right, it will ultimately prevail. So when this organization seeks to do something as basic as feed the hungry as a priority, that's the right question. And to wipe out malnutrition without wiping out the malnourished uh, is the way you reduce health crisis. It's the way you reduce school dropouts. It's the way you increase productivity by doing something as basic as feeding the hungry. Well, you don't have a deficit because the poor didn't work. You have many working poor people. Uh, you didn't have a deficit because many of the poor uh, didn't want to work because whenever you say a thousand jobs are available, five thousand show up. Uh, 
we have a deficit those who who had the party uh, now want the poor to pay for the party that they were never invited to. I submit to you, when they get through, no rich person will miss a vacation or will miss a, uh, a plane trip to wherever they choose to fly to. No, poor, no rich person will lose a home or even a second home. No rich person will miss the opportunity to go to Oxford to Cambridge because there were cuts. So I would submit we still have to measure our strength bottom up and not just top down. And you have to feed the leaves that they might grow. You may feed the roots that they might grow, not just feed the leaves. And the tendency is to sprinkle the leaves and leave uh, the roots dry. And of course dry roots produce barren victories. He's made some huge changes against incredible odds and a relentless hostility. When he came into office, we were losing 750,000 jobs a month. Gushing jobs like the Gulf of Mexico, gushing. In part because um, of trade policy, where we were globalizing capital without global searching for cheap labor markets, without globalizing human rights, workers' rights, women's rights, children's rights, environmental security. And that was a part. So we, were, we lost 10 million manufacturing jobs. We had banks that were not without oversight by the Congress. So those banks brought the whole world banking system to the brink. The big rock in Britain was one of the first to fall. But we bailed out the banks without linking it to lending and reinvestment. So rather than we bail the banks out, we should have restructured the banks. We said the banks were too big to fail, and that's precisely why we should have restructured them, because building them on that, building them out on that premise allowed them to continue what they'd always done. Now the banks have been bailed out. They're getting huge bonuses, but the record-breaking home foreclosures continue to rise, and there is no incentive for them to reinvest. As a matter of fact, the banks are making money off of fees, making money off of private mortgage investment, they're making money off of originating loans, they're making money off of securitization. They continue to prosper as the middle class continues to sink and the poor continue to grow. So that remains a challenge. He fought vigorously for our health care bill. Interesting enough to cover people, uh, often I think of women who had breast cancer or something, a pre-existing condition, who no longer be denied insurance. That's a humane thing. Our students coming out of school with a guaranteed debt without a guaranteed job, they can ask on their parents' insurance benefits until they're 25 or 26. These are huge steps. As opposed to him getting points for this, they challenge his place of birth. It challenged his, um, um, his religious faith. Uh, they called him names. And so even as he was serving the country in a big way, he was being discredited by a significant segment of the mass media, inciting people to fear in very irrational ways. Um, I, I can help but think of the day of the Tea Party rally against the health care bill that Sunday I was in Washington. And those who in the Congress who were protesting against the health care bill, none of them forfeited the health care bill that they had. They were really against it for, some, for their constituents, which is the irony. I met a man who was on an oxygen mask, um, and he said, Reverend, I'm really here because I'm against big government. I said, where are you from? He said, West Virginia. That's the state with the most federal investment. I did get there. We drove here. He drove down a highway, 90% federal subsidized. There he was with an oxygen mask on, a Social Security card in his pocket, all government against big government. He had been driven into some irrational discourse uh, because everything about the health care bill 
and Social Security, which is the safety net for the poor, uh, was to his favor. So his reason for being against the president was for no, was for no good reason. Uh, and yet in spite of that, I believe that the youth vote and the black vote in this season may very well be a weapon against the attempts to take away the gains made in the last two years.